Good morning. We're delighted to have you join us today, both in person and online, at this seminar, Advancing Religious Freedom in a Divided America, put together jointly by the, Inst the um, Center for Law and Religion Studies here at BYU and the Sutherland Institute. And we're really grateful for the chance to partner with them. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Clark. I'm the Associate Director of the International Center, and it's a pleasure to be here today and to have such stellar speakers. I'm looking forward to hearing from them and thinking together about what we can do to advance religious freedom in a uh, fractured society. Our keynote today is Thomas B. Griffith, and it's a real honor and privilege to have him here. Uh, Thomas B. Griffith recently retired from the United States Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit to which he was appointed by President George W. Bush in 2005. He's currently a lecturer on law at Harvard Law School, special counsel at the international law firm of Hunt and Andrews Kurth, and a senior advisor at the National Institute for Civil Discourse. He's a graduate of BYU, we're proud to claim him, and the University of Virginia School of Law. Judge Griffith was a partner at a law firm in Washington, D.C. before he was appointed Senate Legal Counsel, the nonpartisan chief legal officer of the United States Senate. and has amazing stories from that era. Later, he served as general counsel here at BYU. Judge Griffith is a member of the advisory boards of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at BYU and the Center for Constitutional Studies at the Utah Valley University. In 2021, President Joe Biden appointed Judge Griffith to the Presidential Commission on the Supreme Court of the United States. Judge Griffith has authored or co-authored, excuse me, Lost, Not Stolen, the conservative case that Trump lost and Biden won the 2020 presidential election, along with Michael Ludig and Michael McConnell, other formal federal judges also appointed by Republican presidents. I've had the pleasure of interacting with Judge Griffiths over many years, and I'm grateful for his integrity, his deep commitment to public service, and his fabulous, sense, slightly wicked sense of humor. Um, he really is a national treasure. It's an honor and a privilege to have him here today. We're grateful to have him. Afterwards, he's agreed to take some questions. If you'd like to ask questions, we'd invite you to come up to the microphone over there and introduce yourself. So join me, please, in welcoming Judge Griffith. Well, thank you very much, Elizabeth. It's really, really good to be here. Uh, I, it's a place I love and, and cherish uh, and, and many good friends in, in the audience. Um, uh, I want to start by uh, confessing uh, a, a huge mistake uh, I've made uh, in, in, in my life, and I hope that by doing so we'll all feel free to uh, uh, be vulnerable and confess mistakes. Um, uh, one of my favorite quotes in life uh, comes from a, a former judge, a federal judge, by the name of Learned Hand. Um, some people think he was perhaps the most influential and important uh, uh, judge in American history who was not, never on the Supreme Court. But Judge Hand um, uh, would use a quote often from Oliver Cromwell, the, the uh, Puritan revolutionary, and Cromwell said, I beseech ye in the bowels of Christ, think that ye might be mistaken. Uh, Judge Hand said that that ought to be engraved over every schoolhouse, every church, every courthouse, and every legislative body in the United States. Humility is a critical virtue uh, in, in the civic life. And so uh, let me begin by confessing a mistake. Uh, I was brought up short in 2015 by a speech that was given by Dallin Oaks uh, in California to a group of judges and clergymen, um, uh, clergy generally. Um, uh, uh, Elder Oaks um, made the pronouncement that we are not culture warriors. That should not be a paradigm that we use. We are not at war with our fellow citizens, he taught. We are looking for ways to accommodate one another. Well, that brought me up to, that, that made the front page of the New York Times. And it was actually brought to my attention by one of my colleagues on the DC circuit, who had been a student of Dallin Oaks many years before at the University of Chicago. It, it, I read it and it, it brought me up short because I, I realized that in many ways, 
my thinking was that of a culture warrior. Um, uh, Elder Oak's remarks then were reminiscent of uh, the remarks of President Lincoln given at his first inaugural. This is, this is American scripture. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. In, in October 2015, in that address, which had such an impact on me and hopefully other, um, Elder Oaks was rejecting the views of a prominent public figure who I will now quote, quote, civility and decency are secondary values. Culture war means discrediting our opponents. In October 2015, uh, Elder Oaks thoroughly rejected uh, that thinking. Uh, and that's been important to me and that will inform hopefully the remarks I make today and that we'll, that, that we'll all make. Now, uh, the title, Advancing Religious Freedom in a Divided America. I hope that people of faith recognize that whenever we use the term religious freedom, it is for many an ominous phrase because it has been used by some to hurt others, especially women, racial, and sexual minorities. And that's tragically ironic, isn't it? Because the word religion, the English word religion, as we know, comes from the Latin, forgive my pronunciation, legare, legare, which means to bind together. It's the same root of the word ligament. That's what religion means. So how ironic that it has been used by some to divide people and not to bind them together. So the question uh, I, I pose today is, do we use religious freedom to bind people together, or are we like this newly arrived applicant at the pearly gates? Thank you. So how is this done? How do you use religion to bind uh, people together. I, I'm going to talk about two moments in history, uh, one from 1787 and the other from 2022. We can put that down now. That's okay. Um, so uh, 1787, I will talk about the Philadelphia Convention that created the United States Constitution. In, in, in September, when the, when the work of the convention was done, George Washington transmitted the draft constitution to the Continental Congress, and he described how they had succeeded in creating a constitution. He said, the spirit of amity and that mutual deference that the peculiarities of our political circumstances rendered indispensable were, were how they created the constitution. The spirit of amity, the spirit of mutual deference that was required in that moment. Uh, a young scholar named Derek Webb, who was a student of Michael McConnell's at Stanford, um, uh, did a deep dive uh, into the, the, uh, the events of the Constitutional Convention in 1787, trying to unpack what did Washington mean by the spirit of amity, mutual deference. And, and here's, here's what Webb came up with, and I'll, I'll pass it along to you. He thought there were several factors at play here. Uh, first one, uh, there was mandatory attendance. If you were in Philadelphia, you had to show up uh, at, at what we now call Independence Hall. Second, the rules of the convention were such that when someone had the floor, no one else could speak, no one else could even read, no one else could do work. The third factor that Webb looks at is there was no record taken of the boats, no official record taken of the boats, which meant that in May, on Proposition A, you could vote yes, and on July, on Proposition A, you could vote no. And there would be nothing about changing your mind that was negative. There'd be no negative attack ad saying he voted for it before he voted against it. Isn't that awful? No, the idea was that people would come together to listen and that they would be open to persuasion. That's the first factor 
that, that, uh, that Webb talks about. The, the second one that he refers to is what he calls the socializing that took place. Now, Philadelphia did not have uh, great facilities to hold the convention in 1787, so, so the delegates ended up living uh, in, in boarding houses where they were sleeping two or three in a, in a bed. They got to know each other pretty well in that. Um, uh, uh, the, the work of the, the convention would take place typically between 10 in the morning and three and four in the afternoon, Mondays through Saturdays, and then, they would break and go eat. Uh, weren't a lot of taverns at that time, so they ended up forming dinner groups with one another. And these dinner groups were not, you know, by ideological alignment or geographic alignment. They were just kind of thrown together. So you had people from New England uh, having it, being in a dinner group with somebody from South South Carolina. Uh, at key times throughout the convention, uh, Benjamin Franklin, who had the nice house in town would open his house to a grand party. Uh, and the libations flew, and the sense of convivi conviviality was great, and they got to know each other. George Mason, who wasn't a big fan of the convention or the Constitution, wrote to his son, and I won't quote it, but he wrote to his son and said, you know what? We're actually getting to like one another. We have very different views on things, but I'm actually getting to, to, to like these folks. Um, so, so the next point that Webb makes is that all this socializing led to friendship. So the first one, they listened to one another and they were open to persuasion. The second, they became friends with one another. The last one, I think, is the most important. In July, things weren't going well in the convention. It looks like it was going to fall. There were, there were some delegates packing their bags, ready to leave. It looked like it was going to be a failure. The, the, the differences were just too great when 11 moderates met at Ben Franklin's home and decided they were not going to let the convention fail. They were going to persuade their fellow delegates. Now listen to this carefully. This is Webb's key point. They were going to persuade their fellow delegates to compromise for the sake of unity before they knew the terms of the compromise. Do you get that? It was unity first. We'll work out the details later. later. Now, they made some awful decisions in, in that compromise, and we can talk about those on another day, but what I want to focus on is the delegates to the Constitutional Convention put unity first. So put all those together. They listened to one another. They were open to persuasion. They became friends with one another, and they were willing to do something very, very risky. They were willing to compromise for the sake of unity before they knew the terms of the compromise. I know of no better explanation for that spirit that created the Constitution than, once again, from Dallin Oaks, who said recently, on contested issues, we seek to moderate and to unify. If you, as an American, want to learn how to support and defend the Constitution, there's your charter. Your charter to support and defend the Constitution is be somebody who, on contested issues, seeks to moderate and to unify. Now, let's all think of the last social media post we made, uh, the last letter to the editor that we wrote, or the last dinner time conversation we had. And ask yourself, was I seeking to moderate and to unify? And forgive me as the old man for hectoring you and lecturing you, but if, if that's not what you're doing, you are part of a serious, serious problem that I believe poses an existential threat to the Constitution and to the, to the Republic. Uh, that's how you support and defend the Constitution. It's not by pulling out your pocket copy of the Constitution and waving it in someone's face because you're so adamant about the Second Amendment or the 14th Amendment. Or, but those are all important, right? But that's the, that's, those are the trees. The forest is seeking compromise, seeking moderation, seeking unity. For those in my listening audience who are Latter-day Saints, we have a sense that we have some special stewardship with regard to the Constitution, that we have a special role to play in supporting and defending the Constitution. I want to suggest to you that the way we play that role best is by becoming agents of reconciliation and not agents of division. Okay, so that's the first moment that uh, illustrates the point I'm trying to make. Philadelphia Convention, 1787. That was a long time ago. I get it. Let me give you something a little more recent from 2022. 
and from Loudoun County, Virginia, my home county. I don't know if that county, the name of that county resonates with you, but it is ground zero in the culture wars of our nation over public schools. Go look it up. There's, it, it, it has been a difficult, difficult year. Let me, let me give, you, give you some of the context. Um, the state of Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia, mandated that all public schools uh, create policies for the protection of LGBTQ students. Uh, the school board of, of Loudoun County, Virginia, proposed uh, uh, some means to do that. They were very controversial. They had lots of public comments that were rancorous. They had school board meetings where they had to shut it down because people were yelling and screaming. Police had to come to arrest it. This is where I live. This is like, these are, these are all church going folks who are just the most wonderful people, greatest neighbors you want to have. But on this issue, it was chaos and bedlam and anger and vitriol. Um, two people, Melanie Tagg and Chris Stevenson, were lived in Loudoun County and looked at this and saw the way this was going. It was dividing our county, dividing neighbors, and they thought there has got to be a better way to go about doing this. And so they, on their own initiative, <clears throat> decided that they were gonna tackle this problem, that they were gonna try and create an atmosphere in which civil discussion could take place and maybe even compromise could be reached. So what did they do? They reached out to uh, an LGBT advocacy group. They reached out to folks on what we would call the religious right, and they said, we want to get together and see if we can talk this through. You might imagine there was some hesitancy and some reluctance, some distrust on both sides, because they didn't know Melanie and Chris. They didn't know what they were about. They did know the other folks, and they didn't like them much, right? But Melanie and Chris pressed ahead, uh, there, and they, they, they got folks to agree to take a stab at this. Let's see if we can come up with something, something that works. But the first thing that they, the first meeting they had was that Melanie and Chris had to meet with the LGBT advocacy group on its own, and then with the religious right, representative of the religious right on their own. And here's what they did. As, as they met with them, the first thing that they did was they engaged in trust building exercises. They got to know each other's names, the names of their grandchildren. They asked things like, what's your favorite memory from childhood? You know, what's your favorite food? Uh, and they spent a good deal of time in these trust building exercises. Once they went through that, they would then ask the folks, okay, what is your interest in the proposal now before the school board? What, what concerns you? And, and they're predictable. You know, parental rights, safety of, of, of children, use of pronouns, use of bathrooms, all these uh, uh, contentious issues, they were all uh, interested in those. Uh, and, and, and once folks expressed that, that, they met with the LGBT group first, and the next meetings with the folks of the religious right, same exercise. Tell us about your grandchildren. Tell us about your favorite food, your favorite vacation. Now, once that trust was built, tell us about what concerns you and what interests you. These meetings are, are held separately, right? But, but they were so successful that they then took the next step of, let's get us all together. So the next meeting, they're all together. LGBT advocacy group, folks from the religious right, Melanie Tagg, Chris Stevenson. And they went through the same exercise. The first couple hours are spent in trust building now with all of them, right? And then they move to the discussion. So what are your interests in these proposals? What concerns you? Everything was done in a spirit of civility and decency. Then they got to the tough issue. Is there common ground that we have? Um, and there was a long discussion of that. Uh, finally, time had, can't spend all day doing this, so the time of the meeting was over. They, they hadn't resolved anything yet. But the meeting ended with hugs, tears, expressions of affection. They felt like something good was happening. As they left the meeting, they said, what's next? And the next was they created a Google Doc where everyone could put their suggested amendments to the policy proposal, right? And they gave themselves 24 hours once the doc was posted to people to say, you know, on, I, I, I don't like this about this proposal, I would amend it this way, and those sorts of discussions. Uh, they were gonna have 24 hours in which they could do that. Um, and the goal was, if there were proposals on which all could agree, they would forward those to the school board. 
it was a nervous 24 hours, as, as Melanie Tagg tells the story. She posted the Google Doc and then watched. And what she saw unfold was truly remarkable. Proposals were made, clarification was sought. What do you mean by that? Oh, is that what you mean? I thought you meant this. It was all taking place in the Google, Google Doc. Within 24 hours, they had come up with eight proposals on which all agreed. There were two that they couldn't get consensus on. Not surprisingly, it had to do with parental rights, but guess what? They're still working on those. But this group of people who didn't trust one another at first ended up becoming friends, ended up hugging one another and, and, and crying in each other's presence, came together and created consensus on eight of 10 issues about the most contentious issue, perhaps, of our time. That's the spirit of Philadelphia 1787. You, you want to know how to support and defend the Constitution? You do that. We do that. That's how you do it. You don't do it by ranting on cable. You don't do it by, working, by ranting on social media. You do it the way uh, Melanie Tagg and Chris Stevenson uh, did it. So uh, let's go back to the cartoon again. Let me tell you two success stories. How does this happen? I'm giving you a modern example of how it happens. Let me tell you why I really think it works. Um, uh, there are two great success stories that advocates of religious liberty uh, talk about. We have many success stories, but two in particular. Uh, one took place in San Francisco 30 years or so ago. Uh, another was a Supreme Court case that was just decided a couple terms ago called Ful Fulton v. Philadelphia. I won't get into the details in any of these, but, but what I want to tell you is that the advocates for religious liberty came out of these experiences thinking that they had achieved great success. <clears throat> what was the common element in the, the San Francisco uh, dispute and then the Fulton v. Philadelphia dispute? The San Francisco dispute involved the Catholic Church creating a hospice for AIDS victims. And the religious liberty issue involved their ability to continue to do that. And guess what? They were able to do it. The, the Fulton v. Philadelphia case before the Supreme Court involved a Catholic social service agency providing foster care for disabled children. And they succeeded. My point is, you want to get religious freedom? You want to get religious liberty? Forgive the colloquial expression. We need to stop being jerks, right? We, we need to stop using our religious freedom to be divisive. We need to use our religious freedom to bind people together. Ultimately, in my belief, ultimately, religious freedom is not going to be won or lost in the courts. Legal battles have their place, right? But they're not going to be won or lost in the courts. They're going to be won or lost if the American people believe that religious freedom helps bind people together. As long as American people see some advocates of religious freedom working to be agents of division. That's a very risky way forward. So my hope, my prayer, my best efforts, and I hope yours are dedicated to using religious freedom to bind people together and not to separate them. Uh, so may God bless you in doing that, and may God bless the united States of America. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have and welcome pushback. So thank you. So I, I think we have a microphone over here. Uh, and so please use the microphone so the folks at home can hear you. And please ask questions. Please disagree. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? It's a long walk. Thank you. It probably, for the audience, do you mind stating your name and? You bet. Okay. Uh, I'm Danny Frost. I'm the Director of Public Scholarship in the School of Family Life here at BYU. 
And let me, thank you very much for the presentation. I think I agree very much with the spirit of what you're saying, and I think the world would be a much better place if we did this sort of thing. There's a part of me that thinks it sounds a little too simple. Mm -hmm. um, so how much of a value is moderation on certain issues? So you've got a polarizing issue, polarizing issue like abortion. It's the sort of thing where it's really hard for either side to be moderate yeah. about it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, what would you say to that? Yeah, okay. That, uh, I hope you don't mind me saying that's a predictable question because my presentation invites it, right? It all sounds great. It's a great Sunday school lesson. We have to live in a world that is divided. What, what do we do about it? Um, so a, a couple of responses. Um, there are limits to compromise, right? There are limits to compromise. In, in the American experience, we are dedicated to two principles, liberty and equality, right? Now, we can have lots of disagreements about what they mean, and we should. Those are vague terms. How, what do they mean? How do they mean in practice? But the price of admission to this discussion in America is liberty and equality. If you're not committed to that, I'm sorry, you're not, you're not at the table. I'll treat you respectfully, but I'm not going to compromise with you. I'm not going to... I'm not going to compromise with a white nationalist. Sorry, just not going to do it. It's just not going to happen. Um, there are other people I'm not going to compromise with as well. But if, you, if you're committed to liberty and equality, and I am, let, let, let's, let's, let's have a discussion. Now, are there issues um, that even within that limitation we're not going to compromise on? I'm certain there's some, but I think there are not as many as we think. I think there are not as many as we think. I, I don't want to make my talk uh, just all reprising what uh, Dallin Oaks has said recently, but in, 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 at the University of Virginia a year ago, he gave a remarkable address in which he said, and I'm not quoting, maybe I'm interpreting here, he said, hey, religious folks, you've got to give up some stuff here. No, you have to compromise. And, and you need to think through what religious liberty means, and you need to think through what's really core to you, what's really core to you, and, and, and you protect that, but your definition of core may be a little too expansive, maybe a little too expansive. So here's the gamble, here's the gamble. Um, the gamble is, I, I look at things that are important to me, but maybe not core, maybe I can give them up for the sake of your comfort and safety, and so I do, and this is the... This is, I'm going back to Philadelphia, 1787. That's pretty risky, right? I'm gonna give up something for your sake, and here's the gamble, here's the hope. You're gonna do the same for me, right? You're gonna do the same for me. Now, is that naive? I don't know. It's, it's an untested proposition in many ways, right? It's not untested proposition in our personal relationships, but at a, in the national level, maybe it's untested. At this time, of all times, can we do that? I just don't know any other way forward. I, I, because the present, in my mind, is not, it's untenable, it's unsustainable, and uh, it's an existential threat. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me, my name is Steve Nelson. I'm a retired family physician. Um, <coughs> I had the opportunity to read uh, lost, not stolen. I appreciate very much the tone of civility uh, that that uh, that product demonstrated. Um, in the in a follow up to the uh, the issue of some things we just don't compromise on. Uh, it's my understanding that you voted uh, or that you were in favor of the confirmation of Kentanji Brown Jackson to yes, the very much. So I was I was uh, asked by uh, then Judge Jackson to introduce her uh, to the Senate Judiciary Committee, which I, which I did, yeah. Could you walk us through your uh, thoughts and, sure. and, and how you came to be a friend to her and, yeah. uh, and, and perform that function? Yeah, ha happy to do so. Uh, so she and I uh, were judges together. She was a, a trial court judge, and I was on the Court of Appeals that reviewed her work. Uh, we worked in the same building. We did. Uh, several extracurricular activities together, moot courts at various schools and stuff. So, so I, I, I got to know her that way. Uh, I, I actually uh, reversed two of her opinions um, in, in the course of our time. 
course, one of mine was reversed subsequently. So, so we knew each other professionally, uh, not real well socially, but, but professionally, and I was just uh, a real admirer of, of hers. Um, uh, if I were president of the United States, I would not have nominated her uh, to be on the Supreme Court because she has a, a, a different view of the role of a judge than, than do I. But I'm not the president of the United States, and I'm of the view that presidents of the United States ought to get their, get, ought to get their nominees if they're good people and smart and well-qualified, and she's, she's all of, of, of those. In, in my statement to the, to the Senate, I said, um, something's happened. Um, uh, Antonin Scalia was confirmed 98 to nothing, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg 96 to three, and then Justice Scalia's uh, protege, Amy Coney Barrett, uh, didn't get a single vote from the other side of the aisle. In my view, uh, Amy Coney Barrett, who I also testified in behalf of at the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee, should have been 100 to nothing, as should Ketanji uh, Brown Jackson. So, uh, so it comes from, I, I know her, I have confidence in her. I have different views than she does, but that, I, I, think, I, think that's, I think that's what happens in America. Elections have consequences, and uh, so, was that responsive at all? Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you. Honorable Judge Griffith, my name is James Warren Flaming Eagle Mooney. I'm here representing the Salt Lake Interfaith Roundtable. And a question came up to me as you were speaking, which I thoroughly enjoyed hearing such a beautiful and healing presentation on the decisiveness that seems to be so present within our country right now. But it did bring up a question I have, and it's troubling to me, is if churches do not honor the separation of church and state, does that put in jeopardy the First Amendment mm -hmm. in relationship to freedom of religion? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a big question. Um, and uh, the devil would be in the details, right? I mean, because that, that First Amendment also uh, guarantee, guarantees the free exercise of, of religion. And I think, I think the historical argument's pretty clear uh, that at least for the framers, that they anticipated that there would be a role uh, in the public square for churches and, and, uh, and religious expression, uh, that, that they thought that an indispensable part of, uh, of, of the American experience. They, they also prohibited the establishment by the government of, of, of religions. Uh, we've had a debate for a couple hundred years right now about what that, uh, what, what that means. Um, uh, I, I, no question, I, I agree with your premise that, um, um, that if, 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 if the government establishes a religion, if the government uh, is, is uh, uh, obedient to a particular faith tradition or particular religious leaders, that's, that's clearly violating uh, the, the, the content of the Constitution. Um, but I want to be real careful in, in suggesting that people of faith and the religions to which they belong uh, don't have full access uh, to the public square to express their viewpoints and uh, and to do their work, because I think that is, every bit is critical to the meaning of the First Amendment is for. That's, go, go. Not, that's not the issue okay. that I'm concerned about. What I am concerned about is if religion uh, uh, violates that sacred aspect where they actually promote a certain political position. I see. So he's following up and saying, I didn't quite uh, address it. He's more concerned about if a religion gets involved in the political exactly. fray. Um, I, I think the news there is they're allowed to do that. Uh, that may not be wise <laughs> for them to do that. Um, I, I think there's some uh, stuff going on in America right now in faith traditions that suggest maybe it's not wise for uh, uh, folks of faith to align themselves with a particular uh, political view. Uh, that's certainly not my, my approach. I mean, my, my primary allegiance is not um, uh, to a political party. Um, but I think there's room for folks to do that. I, I think there is. I don't think it's wise, um, but there's a lot that's not wise that's still, that's still allowed. So, okay, thank you. 
Hi, Tom. Yeah. Uh, my name is Eric Davis. I'm an attorney here at BYU in the Office of the General Counsel. And I, I love um, what you're telling us about overcoming divisiveness through dinner parties and, and friendship. I'm concerned that there are um, sort of in, entrenched um, uh, interests that profit quite a bit from, from uh, perpetuating divisiveness okay. in our society. And I, I wonder... That would be at least cable news, right? At least, yeah, at least right? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that seems to be accumulating more and more power on the fringes. How it, are dinner parties enough to overcome that kind of... Yeah, I don't know, Eric. That's a tough question. Um, it's, uh, this is hard work, um, and it's countercultural, right? Um, but we can do hard things, uh, um, and I think we have to try. You know, I, I think we have to try to do that. And uh, one of the ways we should try is to make certain that we uh, aren't adding to that. Um, I say this to, to my students everywhere, so I'll say it here. If you're consuming most of your information from social media or cable news, uh, you're being played. It's not, it's not news. Uh, stop it. Get off it. Or if you watch, just recognize that you're being played. It's, uh, there is not breaking news every 10 minutes except on cable news, and the reason it's breaking is because they know, social psychologists know, that's the way to get you to watch. And why do they want you to watch? They want you to watch to drive uh, revenue dollars up. Um, so um, if, you're, if that's where you're getting your information from, I have bad news for you. You're a product that's being played. Um, uh, serious people uh, read newspapers and journals and magazines, and they don't always agree with them, but that's where the serious analysis discussion takes place. It does not play, take place on cable news or social media. And, and what takes place there is, is, is divisive and uh, hurting our country. I, I like uh, uh, a comment Governor Cox made a couple years ago. He said, you know, I used to watch cable all the time. I've been sober for the last eight years. So, do we have time for another question? Okay, one more question. Thank you. Yeah, my name is David Bailey. Nice. Uh, I don't have any credit to say you should listen to me. But one of the things, we may have a common friend, federal judge David Barlow is my personal friend. Great. Great guy. He's a Great dear guy. friend. Dear yeah, friend. super guy. You mentioned in your presentation that in order to participate in a positive way, there was the need for liberty and equity. As I've worked on this problem, and I have for at least two or three years now on unity, I have come to the conclusion that if you want to develop a relationship, the foundation of a perfect relationship is love. We must love God, and we must love our fellow men. And until we do that, we will have a difficult time in unifying everyone. Absolutely. Uh, I couldn't, I, I didn't say it better than that, and I couldn't say it better than that, but you're absolutely right, David. I appreciate that. And maybe that's a good place to, to end. Thank you very much.